All right. There we go. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay. Uh, well, um, I grew up in uh, this town called Oakville, Ontario, or I grew up in Oakville in Southern Ontario. And uh, I was uh, the middle child of two sisters. And it was, uh, it'd probably be what it would be. Um, now you're, you're, you mean you have a, an older sister and a younger sister? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, back then it might've been just normal middle class, but nowadays because of housing prices, like it would be probably considered upper middle class. But it was basically just like a standard kind of middle-class upbringing. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, it was, I had a good childhood up until uh, when I was about, I guess 10, I think it was about 10. It was 2006 when my parents separated. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, at the time, <laughs> like at the time it was uh, like, it was really hard at the time. Like I remember the dinner table conversation when uh, it, it happened and we were all in tears and both my, like everyone was crying. And then like, it's like a week later, um it almost felt kind of edgy because divorce had become so common you know like it, it just it became something so common you know i think it's like i don't know what it was i remember reading a stat somewhere that was like a third of all families or something like that and so it stopped bothering me for a while how old were you i think i was about 10 okay uh 10 or 11 what did you have a sense of why like why they split up yeah uh at the time no okay i had no idea yeah i didn't get it so it was it was just it was just something that was just bang out of the you know where did this come from yeah 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 basically I think that's how it is for a lot of kids, because of course the parent, the, as a kid, you can only look at so much, and you know, parents, of course, as an adult, you can see so much more. So, yeah, yeah. well, it's not until years later, too. Yeah, because the huge thing is the financial thing, because then yeah. you have like, the split income. Yeah, and then like so it was the, the, the financial situation. Like it, it's later on when you realize all the consequences, but at the time, like, you know, even in high school, when I was a teenager, like I was really indifferent to it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember I had this one friend and he, he used to talk about how much he wished his parents divorced. And he'd tell us like, he, you know, he knows why that, that, that he, you know, he'd, he'd give like, uh, whatever he'd say prior that I know it sounds kind of messed up, but kind of wish they got divorced, you know, and, uh, and what did you think when he'd say that? I thought he just wanted it so he could get away with smoking weed. <laughs> 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 Not getting by his parents. Like that was a huge part of it. And, you know, like when I was, cause you, you get away with that stuff more easily. Because, oh. you know, if, eventually when I was in, uh, you know, when I was 16, uh, me and my dad, so I moved, me and my dad moved out. My mom, like they, it was kind of a weird situation. They, they weren't living together, but for a little while they were like after, uh, like immediately after the divorce, my mom didn't have a place to stay, blah, blah, blah. And like, that's, that's we, not uh, that uncommon. I hear that story fairly frequently, especially if because of the financial thing, I mean, <laughs> To suddenly go from one household to two households, that's a huge jump when your whole financial thing is settled on one. Yeah, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> at the time, the move was nice because the, the house we were living in was way smaller and it was like, a, it was a bungalow. You know, it was kind of like the sort of lower blue collar house. and But it was right by the mall where all the kids hung out. And uh, it was really close to a lot of my other friends. So like, it was a move at the time that actually worked out really pretty well. 
and like I got a basement. I had my room in the basement, which I loved, you know, because as a teenager you like it, and then you grow up, and it's like, why well, <laughs> you're just stuck in basements all the time, you know? Because yeah. that's just like your, your uh, I don't know. That's just how it worked out for me. Yeah. You know, I was always living in basements, even not living in a basement, but yeah. Um. So. And um. So did it impact your how you did in school? The the separation? Yeah. Honestly, I, I most of most of I think that I don't know, like I I always had a problem with gaming addiction. Mm-hmm. One of the things that happened, so one of the things that happened uh, after my parents' separation was that they went really easy on us yeah. because they felt guilty, right? And so uh, they, uh, you know, like I was allowed to eat cinnamon buns for breakfast, <laughs> you know? And at the time I was kind of like, huh, why is, why is mom doing this for me? Like, this is weird. And, um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I got really into gaming like MMOs, which are, you know, easily the most time consuming kind of games. And for elementary, that hurt my schooling a lot. Like, it's kind of strange because it consumes memories too. Like it consumes, like, I don't, like grade seven, I was really addicted to a World of Warcraft. And so uh, grade seven is just like a blur to me because of that. Because all my time was just spent playing this game. And, you know, th- that that addiction would come to haunt me back later because mm-hmm. there were these things called private servers. And it was like old school World of Warcraft servers, like unlicensed Blizzard servers that would be hosted by, I don't know, like, you know, whatever, some European guys. And then you'd play those. And, uh, you know, and it, it was just kind of a rush because the game was so addicting and it was like a version of the game you hadn't played. In, in so many years so um so you had nostalgia included you know sort of on top of the just addictive nature of the game itself yeah yeah big time <laughs> yeah so how many years i mean so did you play do you still play or did you play all the way through high school and what, what did that do to your life in high school well, I wasn't playing any MMOs. I stopped, like, WoW got boring by, uh, mm-hmm. so grade seven, 2008 comes along. I mean, I'm going into grade eight and they come out with a new expansion and my parents were just sick of my addiction. They didn't want to pay for the game anymore. And like, I was bored. You know, the game got boring, like end game because you're just kind of stuck at the max level and it's just this chore like grind. And um, so, in grade eight, uh, I had a good friend group. You know, I had a couple of really close friends and we always hung out. We did a bunch of different stuff together. And then, so at that time, like I, I didn't have a problem with gaming until I got a PlayStation 3 in grade nine for Christmas. And that was, you know, like my first game console. And so it was kind of a surreal moment because, you know, everyone I knew had a game console and I didn't. And so when I finally got one, it was just like, Holy crap. Like I'm playing a, you know, I have a PlayStation three in my own home. Like it was, you know, and then that really consumed up a lot of my time in grade nine, but it wasn't the same addiction. Like those games aren't as, they're not as addicting individually, certainly not because there's so much, you know, they're just like single player campaigns, multiplayer games. Like it's not like, you know, this full scale, massive world MMO kind of thing. Right. Uh, but grade nine was also when I started smoking pot. So that's when I started getting into, you know, stoner habits. And then that was, that was all throughout high school. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think what else to throw in here. Like, I had hobbies, Hmm. you know, like I, uh, I took up guitar 
and um I took up skateboarding again too which I I started when I was 11 years old because in elementary there was a bunch of every like so many kids did it and so I thought oh okay so it's the cool thing to do and then when I got to grade nine or when I got to high school I didn't like a lot of the skaters because I thought they were just preppy and I was like eh but then this girl uh I, I there was this girl I uh I met and she like she met me and we like she wanted to hang out and I was like oh okay <laughs> so we ended up making out at night at this uh one of the local skate parks like the biggest local skate park uh and and I found out like she had a thing for skaters so I was like oh I gotta get back into it <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so that's basically what happened and like to this day, it never, um, well, it's funny. Like I still skateboard to this day on and off. Mm -hmm. Like I could never really quit because this is, this is, there's a couple, there's a few reasons for it. Like it, it's kind of something philo more philosophical for me. Like, uh, but <laughs> it's, it's almost like the crush, like, because like, I think like a man's crush on a woman lasts a lot longer Whereas a woman's crush is kind of temporary, you know? I, I think that's true. I think that's very true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, um, what did you, what did, what kind of subjects did you like in high school? <sighs> Not much. <laughs> um, like, I was actually good, like in grade nine, I was pretty good at school. But once I started, uh, once I became, you know, this burnout, you yeah. know, that kind of all just passed on. Yeah. Because it just, you know, it it turns you, it just makes you like, it just turns you into a vegetable, and yeah. it kind of you kind of think like one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so but, did this? So did the pot and all this stuff just kind of go all the way through high school for you? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens, what happens after high school? Um, well, I started working at a restaurant and then the goal was I, I took like a half leap year and then, um, I, I was going to do a year for, of like general arts <laughs> because, you know, it, it was, it was my dad's good advice. Like just do something that you want, do what yeah. you want to do. Yeah. It would, would interest you read yeah. the stuff, like read all the program material and then pick a choice and that's it. That's all there is to it. And so that's what I did. And it wasn't until college that I, I learned to enjoy school and college. Yeah. I mean, subjects in high school, I took an American history class because there was, it was, it was by the same, there was the teacher taught world history and American history and they were both electives but you can only pick one. So I, I chose American history and um, that was okay. I didn't do well on it for so many reasons outlined, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, it wasn't until college until I really started to, uh, and like until I started, I had courses that I actually liked. Like in college, it was the opposite. Like I hated res, I hated college. Like I hated the college life and residence and everything. Like I couldn't stand it. But I liked the school, where like I liked the schooling. And where whereas in high school it was kind of the opposite, for a little while. I mean, most of high school for me was, in hindsight, was, was a nightmare. But like when I was sixteen, I I when I was sixteen I did have good times. You know, I had a good friend group, and even though uh, you know we we smoked a lot of weed and we drank. You know, we didn't, we weren't like, you know, we didn't have sex with all one another and everything like, and at, at the time it was really, really annoying because I had like this, this string of uh, moments like <clears throat> throughout my adolescence where I would come so close to losing my virginity and then it was just snatched away from me. And like, it would always, it, at the time, you know, for a while, it was just the most frustrating thing to look back at my life history and you know, now that I look back on it, I'm kind of like, I don't know. I mean, 
I don't know if I would have turned out that much better. Hmm. I mean, you know, we haven't reached like the point where I became a Christian. Yeah. Which came, which comes much later because that then changes everything. Yeah. So was there, did your parents go to church at all? No. Either before, or after no. the divorce? No, that was, that was just not a part of the picture. No, like we, it was totally atheistic. Like I remember, uh, like, I think it was grade three or four. I asked my dad if God was real. Yeah. And I think at that point, that's when he told me he wasn't. And it's strange now because I don't know if this happened before or after, but as a kid, like as a, as a child, I'd be laying in my bed at night at times. And like, I'd have this existential dread about death, Yeah, you know? And I can't remember if it was after he said that or before, like if this is just a consequence of growing up in a house without God. Yeah. You know? It's not uncommon for a kid to have an existential dread about death. I mean, because once again, it's, it's hard for us. It's hard to recognize what you don't know. It's hard to see the edges of your knowledge. And then of course, as a child, you're just, things are just opening up slowly and then, of course, with something like a divorce, it's a trauma. But then at some point, as a child, you're going to learn about death, and that's going to be out there. And then you're going to realize, wait, I, this, this, and and then, so it's it's a lot. It's a lot. And so then you're, you're in high school, and you're playing around with this stuff, and you're but then you go to college and you discover you like learning what happened with the pot and the video games. Did it go away or did it just kind of recede a little bit and not eat everything? Well, <clears throat> when I went into college, like I was really hoping I wanted to get away from all of that, mm. you know, like, uh, because when I was 19 prior, prior to going into college, uh, or 18, for a little while I was selling dope. Like I was a pusher, like just weed and, and, you know, um, and I just wanted to get away from it. Like I, I wanted to get away from that lifestyle. Like, because to me, it was just like, I'd already lived it. I already lived it. Like I, you know, taking stuff up my nose. I mean, not like addictively, but you know, I smoked all the dope. Like it was just like, you know, you have these experiences and <laughs> you get tired of their pleasure. Like, you just like, eh. but when I went into college, you suddenly are surrounded by all these kids who haven't done this stuff yet, yeah. you know? And then, uh, so it was just, I was hoping that wasn't going to be the case. What, what wasn't going to be the case that, that, that other people be... weren't going to now sort of discover this in college, what you had lived in high school. Yeah. 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 And so um so what did that do to you when you realized that when you realized that you were on an accelerated path <laughs> compared to others because probably many of those kids in college, you know, a lot of studies show that in college kids who make it to college proportionately more often come from homes that didn't have a divorce that doesn't mean that divorced kids never go to college it means that basically if you have an intact home if you're if you don't have the financial challenges if you don't have the trauma chances are better you're going to make it to college people who have college educations divorce less i mean there's a whole clumping of different sociological groups there so when you go to yeah. college in some ways you enter a different population and then you discover that a whole bunch of these kids that have lived lives where their parents had had a degree of control and that control meant that they didn't sort of get lost and have unlimited time for video games and have lack of supervision to do pot etc cetera, etc cetera. now a bunch of these kids go to college and now they're going to discover pot and video games and you know hooking up and all of this stuff but just at an older age and you get to college and you look around and you're like uh yeah yeah you know where that goes <laughs> they don't yeah and you do <laughs> yeah 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 i mean it, it produced a bit of an ego like mm. at the time 
Um, cause you, you just, they, you know, kids felt like they, they just wanted to be edgy about it and, or they felt that it made their, their, their lives authentic, like something like that. Yeah. And, huh. <laughs> so, okay. So what did you study in college? Well, I took the the I took humanities mm -hmm. and then humanities stands out and um you know Jordan Peterson is is absolutely right about the humanities like nothing is cited <laughs> you know I mean as much as I really like the course because uh it you know even even though college was just like a freaking like a, just a hellhole at times like it really it directed my intellect you know and i learned all these things that i actually had an interest in that at the time i didn't think i i had, I had no idea that i would you know um and there i took a number of film courses too and that got me really into movies i mean i had some some i had an inkling of, of interest in in film before like particularly after I watched that uh, that movie Fargo, because I would just never seen a movie done that way, like with that kind of realism. But when I took when I went into college, like I took a number of film courses, and so I got really into movies. And um, I'm trying to think what else stands out. I mean, there was the social sciences, and there was this other course called human relations, which was kind of like a psychology course, mm -hmm. you know, a pretty decent, it was a good course. I really liked my professor. Yeah. Um, what, what happened in terms of um, girls and women in college? Any steady girlfriends at that point? No, no, mm -hmm. I, I've never had a girlfriend. I had one in high school for like a month mm -hmm. when I was like 16. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was it like you why, know, why do you think so why do you think that's the case oh, <laughs> i've been out of trying to answer that question for years <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a number of reasons i think i've sort of cracked it uh you're not a bad is... looking guy you're smart you know how to talk i mean we'll get to the we'll get to the stuff after college in a little bit but just looking at you, it doesn't seem like this, like, you know, the sub guys I meet, it's like, yeah, they're, it's going to be rough, but that's not my sense with you. Yeah. Um, the, the reasons I think are, I think growing up in a household of women, I think that's one of them, but it's compounded with the fact that my dad didn't know how to deal with that dynamic because like my my mom had a my mom had a temper my mom had a real temper you know my dad was the very kind of uh, emotionally level-headed one but my mom had a, a real serious temper like you know the quote don't don't cry over spilt milk like at the dinner table that was what really triggered her you know it was like don't spill the milk because if you spilt the milk literally like you know my mom just had a hissy fit like she would just freak out about it and you ever hear of borderline you know, personality and, disorder pardon me you ever hear of borderline personality disorder yeah okay i don't know if that's her maybe yeah <laughs> I'm, i i don't know but um but she'd fly off the handle and um, could you, as a child, sort of predict? I mean, did you sort of walk on eggshells around her all the time? Or did your father do that? No, it was just my, yeah, my dad did. I think my dad did a bit. Mm. I didn't, I, it was never. A, she just had a. Did I say she had a hair trigger temper? No. Okay, good. She didn't have that kind of temper, but she just had a real temper and like she could just um 
it, it was just stuff like that that she would freak out about and I, I didn't walk on I in a kind of sense she she in many ways she became the problem was is she became more of the father figure than my dad because of her like real kind of well she you know she's she was the dutch side of my family so she's got kind of a big mouth <laughs> um <laughs> so that's but, hilarious uh when you know my dad when she would have these hissy fits my dad just kind of shut down mm. like he wouldn't do anything and yeah. he, he didn't know he just didn't know how to deal with the situation yeah and and it frustrates me now looking like at the time like i i think he thought he was doing the right thing yeah you know and it ties into the whole idea of like putting the woman in her place it's like it's not a matter of being some kind of tyrant yeah. <laughs> it's just like he just couldn't he, he just you know he wouldn't try to calm her down and settle her and like yeah and even at times himself like raise his voice when he needed to yeah like, yeah, you don't want to see your parents yell and fight and everything. But it's just like, you know, there was just too many times where he had to put his foot down. And so basically, you know, back to the whole girlfriend thing, it's like, like this is kind of what I'm seeing. Hmm. Is that the kind of woman runs the show? Yeah. You know, and it's not the only reason. Yeah. The other reason what the other reason was is that when I was 17, 18 that's when I became a porn addict. Okay. And that hasn't like, it, it hasn't left me to this day. Yeah. Like it's still this, I don't know what to call it. Like it, it's, you know, it's like you could call it a demon, but it gets to a point where it's like this thing is, I don't know, like it's its something, it's truly diabolical, yeah. you know, and yeah. um, so that was the other reason, and, you know, and so you just, and then politics. I think that's partly to do with it too. All the mm. stuff that came later on also. the internet. Well, when Jordan Peterson, like, I, I mean, when I guess an example would be like when Jordan Peterson came out, you know, uh, it's like if you went up to any woman and, and said, like, you know, here's the guy, like, he was the guy to me, yeah. you know, in terms of like being like the ideal man. Yeah. let alone a, a canadian yeah like it's uh, you know i mean to, because to me that's also the reason for uh, my, my initial strong biases towards him is that like to have like this canuck yeah like come out and but you know it was like okay he's educated you know he's a high earner like he's super intelligent you know he's got a wife he's got kids like he's successful in every freaking way he's disagreeable you can't push him around yeah. And my sis, and I'm like, you know, if I went up to my sisters and described them this man, yeah. you know, and they couldn't stand them. Yeah. <laughs> they just couldn't stand the guy. Yeah. And so it was like, what the way? Like, I don't, I just, you know, and like, I'm not the only guy to say this. And I had a conversation with a friend last night over the phone about this because we've been talking about it a bit. And, and it's like, you know, yeah. I don't think uh, like guys out there have said how women don't like intelligent men. Yeah. You know, and it was that conversation you had with Aaron Wren. And then I started uh, exploring his sub stack and then he had a, he had an article and he had a chart and under beta characteristics of that chart was intelligence. And that's how I knew this guy knows what he's talking about because like the whole like general intelligence isn't like it's not there's no sexual attraction to it and i think with the 20th century like there was kind of this romanticizing of intellect like they made it kind of they made it something look sexual and it's not 
But the thing was, everyone was doing it. So it just kind of, everyone just went along with that whole idea. And it's just not true at all. Because it's like, you know, like no one likes like the sort of posh arrogance intellect and all that. Like, you know, and my friend was telling me, like, I had another friend, he was telling me like, women hate that. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, women don't like it event like they're not interested in it in general like it doesn't matter if you have like this brash intellectualism or whatever um but um so you develop like all this resentment because it's like you see these guys who aren't as smart as you and then they got all this game and it's just like, and you know, I mean, my parents thought that with me, like, because I was the smartest one between me and my sister. So they just thought he'll just figure it out on his own. Yeah. It's like, I, I it's just so naive. Like, no, I'm like, what? Because th there's no, there's no correlation between how big your brain is and your will to act. Yeah. Like there's no correlation. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean it's 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 funny talking to you now because like there's actually a lot that's I don't know I, I just don't know how much to talk about. Um. So. Okay, so what what did you get your degree in college? Well, it was only one year. Oh. So I just okay. this, I just I just got a certificate. Okay. So um, what'd you do after that? just started working blue coat, like just started working in factories and stuff, just low income work. And my thinking was, which wasn't like, didn't surprise me. Like it wasn't really a disappointment because all I wanted to do in college, like, like I said, it was just to learn, you know, that's it. Um, and uh, I started just working all these factory jobs and I was just, um, I was terrible at holding down jobs for a while. Mm. Why? You know, not show uh, up just, for work or not perform at work. Yeah. There'd be late, there'd be lates, there'd be truancy, like stuff like that. Because you slept um, in or were you still doing sort of video games and pot? And I mean, what were you doing in your free time? Well, I was, yeah, there was a bit of weed for a bit, like, um, after college and then i really did eventually like kick it entirely you know and and uh and then there was gaming because the, the the reason wasn't like it's it's i mean yeah i wasn't waking up on time but i wasn't going to bed on time yeah so you just stay up all the freaking night yep yep yeah way too late and you know this factory I was working at in the beginning was twelve hour shifts and it was alternating shifts like you know so you do night you do the two two days on three day uh, two days on two days off three days on two days off and then it would cycle until and then it would reverse the next couple of weeks um and it was night it was night shifts and day shifts it would alternate between night and day that's 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 just hard I mean I mean people don't realize how hard night shifts are on people especially when they yeah. alternate I mean, you can kind of get acclimated to working night shifts but so when i was in college i worked a lot of security work and that was a lot of night shifts and boy if you start living that way you just live upside down yeah 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 i mean there was this one iranian guy i worked with and he was like old iranian yeah you know like christian like he fled the country in 79 yep. or whatever and uh, but by the time I was by the time, well, they sacked me, but by the time they sacked me, like he had Alzheimer's and he was only 64. Wow. You know? Yeah. So. So you mentioned you became a Christian. How'd that happen? Oh, <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> but oh. uh, yeah. Um, well, Jordan Peterson comes around and then. I started consuming his channel. There was a whole period where I was on YouTube for a while. Like something kept replacing something else of, of that interested me. Yeah. So when I first got on, started diving deep into YouTube seriously, like I got into channels like Wisecrack. I don't know if you heard of them. Yep. 
And then the School of Life was another one that I got really into. And and to this day, I think they actually still do good videos. Yeah, they do. Then came, but School of Life was very, very like, you know, it's Elen, Elenda Batons. He's like the CEO and he has his calm, soothing voice, you know. And then came Jordan Peterson. And, uh, you know, that's like David Fuller said, you know, from uh, uh, Rebel Wisdom, like, uh, it was exactly what some like the culture needed. So then it was exactly what I needed. Yep. Because Jordan Peterson, like the, the, the thing that's, and I first came across him in the newspaper because there was, I was working at that factory job and then I'm looking at the paper and this was the whole bill C 16 thing. And, uh, the first thing that struck me was just how blunt and matter of fact he is, because that's kind of a Canadian thing. Like, <laughs> it's you know, Canadian we're thing. really matter of fact people. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, he, he just had that. I was like, I just couldn't get over the conviction. You know, I mean, I, um, I don't want to like get into politics here or anything, but it just like at the time, like the, the, these transgender people were, uh, they felt they were untouchable. You know, and for this guy to stick his finger out, it was like, holy crap. Anyway, yeah, I come across his all his motivation lectures then afterwards. Sometime afterwards, and um, I just got hooked. And then, but, you know, it was just, it. but it, it the, the thing was, is like, there was also there was Jordan Peterson, and then there was things like all the YouTube blood sports that they called it. Yep, yep. And so during this time, it was a really demoralizing time for me, like uh, because of all of that. Because like to me, it was just like, um, you know, I was just this completely freaking broken ass kid. Yeah. Like and and uh, like. I didn't understand what, what people just didn't get about him at the time. Yeah. Like Peterson. Yeah. And um, so anyway, moving on, I, I discovered, I remember seeing your channel. Like I saw you in the, the recommended. And at the time, like, it's just my atheist self. I'm like, Oh, bald deer, bald dude, like beard. Eh. You know, <laughs> Like I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't commit to it. And then, uh, then Jordan had his Sam Harris talks and, you know, like people were treating like the whole, uh, Peterson and Zizek thing. Like that was the debate of the century. But for me, I just, to, for me, it was Harris and Peterson. Yeah. That was the big deal for yeah. me. Yeah. And I was like, all right, like, well, let's, let's listen to this guy, like, you know, your channel, like, and, um, you know, when I started listening to your channel, that's when everything, you know, that's when everything clicked because it was, it's, it was like uh, with, with Peterson and his religious views, you know, it was like with um, Pajot, how he talks about how people have no idea what he's talking about for like two years. Yeah. And it was the same thing with me and Peterson, with yeah. my view on Peterson. Yeah. I didn't know what he was talking about really, yeah. but I didn't, he didn't, he never sound like, I just thought, well, I'm just too dumb. Like I'm not sophisticated enough. And like, this guy is a professional and I, I don't know what I'm, so he, he, you know, I, I always believed that he was saying he was being honest, yeah. you know, and it wasn't nonsense. Yeah. And so that's how I came across your channel because then like everything just started, everything just came together with the, like how you were just summarizing it. And so that's when, that's when I learned like that, that's when I learned like, this is the way, like, this is, you know, this 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 is the way this is this is the the way out yeah um and you know it's not like christianity like it's really something not to go in alone like it can be really deadly like really dangerous like it's a really dangerous thing so you know I started, I, I wasn't going to church until I was like, I'm 29 now. And I wasn't going to church. I didn't first start going to church until I was like 27. But I started calling myself a Christian when I was about 25. 
And, you know, I've been working all these odd jobs, like just in factories continuously. Because the goal was to save up to go to a trade school, which eventually I would be able to do. But I just had such, I was so bad at holding a job because I was just irresponsible, like just kind of this, like, you know, just this beta. Like, yeah. You know, and, and um I worked at this one greenhouse and like this is when the Christian faith like this is when it was really uh this is when I felt like the real weight of it like you've made the point before that when people first get into it like it it's the every it consumes all of their attention yeah you know and then they just um like they just devote themselves to whatever or it's it just it like I said you know, and um, I, like, I wasn't praying, like, I, I, I was praying, but it was getting, like, this job that I was working in was multi-ethnic and multicultural, because yeah. it's Canada, and, like, these lower income jobs, like, a lot of these factories, they're all like that. Oh, definitely. And, and one of the things about multiculturalism is just how depressing it can be because of how alienating it is because you're just too, you're surrounded by just too many people who you just don't have enough in common with. And, uh, and, uh, this job, um, Like, there were a couple Arabs that worked there, like Muslim dudes. And I always really envied the, the fact that, like, they were just, uh, they just seemed, like, allowed, like, this, this real traditional masculine identity. And you just felt totally denied that. And, and like there's all this 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 workplace I was working in was like it was just a mess. It was just a total mess. Like they'd hire these Mexicans, um, uh, like they were just like you know hired by some temp agency working for like you know, like freaking nine dollars, eleven dollars an hour, something like that. But of course back home they're making like twenty five, you know. But they didn't speak any English and like you know they, they weren't they weren't competent and like they just and it's just like i can't handle i'm just like i and you know at the time i'm i'm trying to be a good christian yeah you know and but i'm not going to church you know because i was just being i don't know I, I was just so naive and 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 you know it was the pride like it was just filled with the there was that there was that always that like that part of your spine that doesn't want to leave kind of feeling like that you can do it on your own kind of thing sort of and it was just an unbearable weight at times and yeah. you know like i'd been dealing with suicidal ideation like all throughout my 20s mm -hmm. you know like it has it, been just this threat all throughout my 20s and so at this during this time at this uh at this greenhouse I developed like, you know, there'd be nights where I just developed a lot of resentment towards him, you know, and I'd be laying towards in my God. bed. And yeah. Towards God, towards Jesus, you know, and I'd just be saying like, I, you know, I'd be, be uh, crying, like just really crying and, yeah. you know, cursing him with every vile thing I could say, yeah. because I was just like, you know, what do you want from me? Like I freaking yeah. surrendered. Like yeah. I've done everything. Like, what what more do I need to be put up? What more do you need to put me through? You know, I mean, yeah. like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, like why, like why me? Yeah. You know, it, it's, and eventually, you know, <laughs> freak. It's so hard to talk about it because, like, there's, there's so many different like relational experiences you have with God. And like, and, and it's, it's uh, eventually I got over that. Now I got out of that job. I quit because it was a mess. And there was some, there was things that went on there that was just like time to leave. 
And I tried to join the army as a reserve, like, cause reserves are just part-time training, you know, and um, you know, it's sort of voluntary. Like if you're called to duty or whatever, you can volunteer rather than being, you know, rather than it being by fiat. And, you know, I tried that, but I, I, I didn't make the cut because, you know, I had all this drug history. I had all this alcohol, his history of alcoholism. And, and, you know, I used to be on antidepressants and I haven't been on antidepressants in years. Like I just haven't needed them. And because after I, I called myself a Christian, I just didn't need them anymore. Even in all of that, like despair and not, and, and kind of nihilistic, what whatever, this kind of nihilistic thinking. And I didn't, when, with, with God in my life, like, even if it felt like he was just spitting on me, I didn't need it. Um, anyway, I, I got denied and like, I didn't, I got denied by the army. And to me, this is before the truckers convoy. So this is before all of that. And like, at the time I was like, just to me, it just felt like a betrayal because initially going into it, I thought, Oh, well, for guys that have no hope left and there's nothing left, they join the army. Yeah. That's what they do. Yep. And then, but you, you know, you sign up and try to get into the reserves and then they just, they're just like, nope, sorry, you don't have, you're not clean, you know, cause I, and so I just saw that as a betrayal. Like, like it was like my country, like betraying me. Like that's how it felt. So I'm like, oh, like what the hell? There's not, there's nothing, there's no hope. And well, there's no hope for the military. And um, after that, I uh, got a job working at Canada Post, which is our postal, National Postal Service. And I've been working there ever since. So. Oh, you're holding down a job. That's that's a that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, it keeps you know it keeps me living yeah it keeps me off the street yeah you know there's a lot of homeless here yeah and uh the housing's really expensive in canada yeah you can't afford anything yeah and it's not going to change right no. like no. it's just something i accept yeah you know it's like how people talk about retirement here because at canada post we have good pensions yeah good pension but it's like Look at our economy. This this isn't going to mean anything in twenty years. Yeah. So retirement to me, and the thing is too is like, what am I? What are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do for retirement? Like, I just I've thought about it that you know it's like, you know, all these retired people just die in a hospital bed. Like, I'd rather be dying on my feet. Like, if I have to work till I die, it's not such a big deal to me. You know, like it's, um, so. I'd rather die that way than as a vegetable. Yeah. So did you find a church? I did. I did. How, I did how, find a church. How'd that go? Uh, well, I took your advice because you said that, you know, if you're going to join a church, join a small church. And so I looked around and I, uh, you know, I had a, biased towards anglicanism because you know it's canada and the and you know our british tradition <laughs> so i went for an anglican church this high anglican church this small church and i've been there i started going there uh 20 i think it was 2022 2022 okay. i started going there for maybe a couple months and then i took a long break which was a mistake but then I came back and ever since then, I, I haven't taken any of these really long breaks. And I've been back to that. I've been going to that church for, yeah, roughly over a year now. Okay. Does and, the priest um, know you? Yeah, we have, uh, we, yeah, we have like regular, not regular, but we've actually had some like uh, personal conversations, like Good. meetups. Good. Because it turns out that he, <laughs> he actually knew about Jordan Peterson and John Verveke. And he he's actually watched Awakening from the Meaning Crisis twice. You know? <laughs> um, How's church going? It's I feel held down. Mm. Like when I'm in there, I feel like anchored. 
mm. I love I love it. Like, you know, it's a it's like it's cat. I mean, it's Catholic. Like, because I learned on Discord, like bridges of meaning, that there's some people who get triggered by saying Anglo Catholic. Yeah. They're like, well, there's only one. What do you mean Anglo Catholic? There's no such thing. <laughs> Because people in my church will say that. They'll say, oh, you know, Anglo-Catholic. So I thought, oh, okay, that's kind of, that makes sense. You know, but it's just like, it's, um, you know, and I have a rosary, like I, I, I try, you know, I, I try to pray with the rosary twice a day. Yeah. And um, but it, it's, I mean, it's the thing about our church is it's dying fast. I'm the youngest. Yeah. yeah. And there's like 30, there's, I don't know, regular of like 35 heads. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so when I came in there, they they saw me as like. Hope. You know, Hope. Yeah. I'm like Paul Atreides from Dune or something. That's right. Your validation. It's like, yeah. we're still at church. Look at this guy's come in. No, yeah. you're you're special to them i'll tell you you are special to them they probably don't quite know what to do with you or how to love you but you are special to them yeah yeah it's just it's it's strange because there's a lot to you know there's a lot you don't reveal yeah um no I you know that. when you're in there because you don't want to right right no you might be surprised though i mean and i wouldn't just say everything to anyone but there will be people there that you see that you might look at them and think oh they have their life together they've never done anything wrong they've never you'd be surprised if you learned their story that they might not have had the exact same things but they've dealt with stuff because i know that like i've said i've baptized men in their 70s and those men that have baptized in their 70s They've lived life. And again, there weren't computer games. Maybe there wasn't pot, but there was alcohol and there was war and there were women and there were divorces. And uh, there were, I mean, some old people have lived very nice, stable, sheltered lives. God bless them. Some old people have been through wars and you look at them now and they look peaceful and calm. Part of that is old age, because the thing is, when your body gets into the 70s and 80s, it can't handle much stuff anymore. So they they have to live routines, just because if you don't live routines, you just feel so awful. That's the thing about youth. Youth, you, you can get away with your, your body, lets you get away with stuff. And it's, you know, but as you get older, it's like, no, you better eat right. You better go to bed on time. You better get enough sleep or that body is going to punish you and you don't want to feel that bad. So, but you'd be surprised. There are some people in your church who are older. You could ask your priest, your priest would probably know that have lived through some life. And um, there's probably some people there that you could that you could talk to. This is part of the reason I started Estuary at church because- I knew some of the younger people coming in would look at the older people and say, they can't relate to me because they, they've got their life together. But I know, you know, especially in, in a church like mine, where you have a significant African-American population. I mean, you're at, if you were at, growing up African-America, African-American in America in like the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it was hard. I mean... People talk about racism today. Yeah, there's still racism, but it was it had teeth <laughs> in Jim Crow. And and these people, these people knew poverty, these people knew suffering, and they have endured. And if they got into their 80s and they're not bitter or resentful and resentful, but they're kind, it means that they've overcome. And many of them have only overcome because again. On one hand, they had bitter racism, but on the other hand, they did have the church and they did have community. And what's happening now is that people don't have community, they don't have family, they don't have church. Boy, you, yeah, and everything you've just described. I mean, I could, <laughs> I, I can't, I've got so many randos conversations that have never been shared, and I don't know what we'll do with this one, but. 
you are by no means alone in telling your story. Your story is quite common. Everybody's story is different. Yeah. But um, but yeah, you might be surprised by some of the people in your church and what they've endured and how they've overcome. So they're there. Yeah. But you but if yeah. you just look at them, you might not guess it because they're wearing clothes, they drive a car, they have a house, they don't cuss, they don't do drugs, they look normal. But that normality has been earned with with a lot by some of them, probably. So Yeah. Yeah, it's the funny thing you say about like racism in the United States because like you know on, on places like 4chan, which I don't go on anymore. But uh, you know, between the black white dy dynamic uh in America from an outsider, it, it even if like C words and N words are thrown, like it it, it kind of just seems like a sporting match because it's kind of like yeah, but you guys, you share like 400 years of history with each other. And like real racism is when there's a foreign entity come. Like that's when you feel it because you don't recognize these people. You don't know who they are, the music that they're playing. Like, because I want to, there's a bunch of videos I want to do. I do want to start a YouTube channel. Like I actually have a couple, but they only have a video, one video on there each. And you know the, the, it's not really that they're, they're just not like sophisticated videos which is okay like i don't really care but no there's a bunch of there's a lot of stuff i want to talk about like um because the, the van Gogh's year like that's the channel for the tlc i don't want that like i don't really want anything political on that channel like yeah. like the, the the stuff regarding canada for example like the situation here that's yeah. just not being talked about yeah. I don't want any of that there. Like, yeah. you know, I, I want that more specific to TLC stuff. Yeah. And uh and just like cultural stuff too. Like, you know, like yeah, I mean, there, there's gifts God gave me along the way. Yeah. And one of those gifts was Burn Powers in an Adramus channel because when I was working at, at Bayview Greenhouses or Bayview, the greenhouse that I was working at. That's when I came across his channel and he was, it was through a, the Randall's, the first Randall's conversation I think you had with him and I go on his channel and like right there is like how we got here, the 1970s, how we got here, the 1960s. And I was just like, why? I was like, finally, because no one was talking about this stuff. And for years I thought this stuff was so important. Yeah. Like there's a, you know, there was one conversation Eric Weinstein had on his portal yeah. podcast a while back with that writer, Brett Easton Ellis. And like for half the talk, all they did was talk about what LA was like in the eighties. That's all I wanted to hear them talk about because they were just bringing in this perspective that no one actually remembers or knows about anymore. Like this stuff is really important guys, you know, like, yeah. um, I mean, I don't want to get preachy about it. Like, you know, ramming it down people's throats or whatever but man like his channel like burn like like that guy's a genius like like he's like his his whole time series too like yeah. you know like he basically came up with like i guess what you would call his own like metaphysics on time like um yeah. it was just you know and, and he's so creative like i was just like frig it, it felt like a blessing because it was the kind of quality it was a kind of, uh, you know, video, it was the kind of information I needed. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what else? Is there, is there any kind of estuary at your church? Um, no, not really. I mean, you it's should... basically just between me and, uh, my minister. Like, well, uh, we will, I mean, you'll have to show this video to your minister and, uh, and tell him to, if he wants to start an estuary, let me know. I there's we've had difficulty getting him going in Canada, but there I got some other clergy in Canada who kind of want to start one and they don't quite have enough people show up. But if we can maybe get enough together, because 
to me, you know, what you just described in terms of Burns channel and, 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 you know, it's one thing to start a YouTube channel and to do some virtually not alone TLC stuff, but it's YouTube is pretty, it's a much bigger deal if you're talking in a room and there's no camera on and you can speak freely and then you can, you can begin to, because you need a community because I mean, all of the stuff that you're, many of the stuff that you're talking about, I mean, we go all the way back to where this conversation started. It was the breakdown of your family. You were, so I'm, I'm the same way. I have an older sister and a younger sister, but there wasn't a breakdown of my family. And when I was growing up, there were no video games. Yeah. There were kids in my Christian school that did pop, but that had no attraction for me. We had church. I had my father and my mother. I had my extended family. I had friends. And, you know, me and my friends, we'd play Avalon Hill games. We'd play Risk. We eventually found Dungeons and Dragons. We didn't mess around with girls because we were too nerdy. <laughs> we didn't know what to do anyway. That would have, that would have to wait. But, um, you know, I had all of that to sort of hold me. And what happened really early on was there was nothing to hold you. And so what happened were things captured you. And and instead of being held by something, something good, you were captured by something a lot less good. And because everybody needs a container. Because if you don't have a, it's like having a body without skin. I mean, you, you, your, your, your intestines are, you know, dozens of feet long and, you know, you'd be all over the place. You need skin to contain you. But a human being is not just something contained in skin. You need something to contain you. And so, you know, again, a church is something to contain you. And it's not a perfect container and churches struggle, but it at least is something to, to contain you. And so your, your relationship with your priest, with your minister well, there's there's a container because you know if you if you go off the deep end one way or another you've got that relationship with him and 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 that even 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 if that relationship is thin it's a container and you need that and then what you really want to do is you want to grow that container to include other people so that there's a network of relationships and every person in that relationship is important but the, the network grows. And so YouTube does this a little bit. And that's sort of the virtually not alone network with, with burn powers and sort of, and everybody sort of pieces together their own little network. They might not watch this one over here or that one over here, but they do find some like, like burn or someone else that sort of contains them. And then they find some joy. And then, you know, I just, the video I just released this morning, just noticing people out there in YouTube that are, they're just out there in YouTube. They don't have a container. You need a container. Yeah. And so, um, and and you've started, I mean, going to church now, however, however that's going, and it's never perfect. It's never enough. It's never, but it's, you've got something. And now that you've got something, now you can really begin to build. And, you know, and the whole, you know, people, people think it's silly but like when you have two parents in a functioning household, you have a bedtime and mom or dad has breakfast on the table. Those are containers. And, you, and, and so now, okay, so now you're going to bed and you're keeping a normal rhythm and then you're eating breakfast in the morning. And then, then you've got the structure of school and then you've got structure after school. And I mean, all of those are containers and, so like what happened with you early on, those containers just withered. And so so now you're building containers. And like I said, those old people in your church, they've had a lifetime to construct containers around them. So when you see them and there's order, they've got some raggedy ends. Trust me, I know old people too, but they've got something. And so now, you know, now you're getting to the end of your 20s in my experience, when people get into their thirties, some of the, some of the debts, some of the bills due from early childhood come due in their thirties. 
And so that's when, okay, now, now I'm really going to think about, but you're a little accelerated again because of what you described with, with respect to college. So now it's like, I, I've got, I've got wounds. I've got trauma. I've, I, 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 I made some debts in my body and in my psyche and in my person. And I've got to come to terms with those things. It sounds like you've already been doing that. So, you know, as you get into your thirties, again, the fact that even if it's Canada post and whatever that job is like, it's a container and you're holding it down and you're doing it. And, and what might happen is at some point you might decide to, you're going to, you know, grow in competence in with Canada post, or maybe you'll get something that's a next step up, but you, I mean, you're, you've already, you've been putting yourself together for a while now and it's been slow and painstaking, but you've been doing it and that's, that's not nothing. So yeah. you should have some pride <clears throat> in that. Well, it, I remember uh, the School of Life did this video a while back, uh, uh, that YouTube channel, and they called it, it was called Self-Sabotage. And they brought up this really great point about the reason people don't like work hard to improve themselves is because things like happiness are so foreign to them. Yeah. Like it's, you know, like the, those, and so for, throughout my 20s, it was like, I was just really scared about like, like with Jordan Peterson's advice and all his wisdom and all this stuff, because the thing about him is that he could act it out and that's what separated. That's what made him so unique. Yeah. Is that like, he actually could live by this stuff that he was saying. And it's the yeah. first thing, you know, you acknowledged about him. Yeah. But for me, it was just too scary. Yeah. Like, and I couldn't admit that to myself. Yeah. Because it was just like, I don't even know what this is going to do to me. Like, what am I supposed to do if, if I actually start feeling these great feelings? Yeah. Like, I don't know how to handle this. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I was too scared that it's like, I'm just going to throw it all away again. Like it happened before, you know, and, the, and, and, and then I'm just going to tumble down the mountain. Like I'm just going to just fall down into a pit. Yeah. You know, like I get, yeah, get to the top and then you fall down. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know. So I think it was, I couldn't, I couldn't do without God. Like the, you know, and, and the other reason for surrender was just like Jordan Peterson wasn't going to be enough. Yeah. You know, the guy's still just a mere human being. Like you can't worship him. No. <laughs> you can't do that no. stuff. Right. No. So no. he just wasn't going to be enough. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, and I, I just thought in, you know, in, in things like Christianity, um, if you don't have, um, like you said, if you don't have all the containers, like you can't thrive as an intel as an intelligent man, which sounds, which may sound arrogant or pompous, but I don't really care because it's, to me, it's true. Yeah. Like, why should I be trying to like starve what I'm capable of? Yeah. You know, like I, I, that, that feeling is, is a horrible feeling. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah. but you, I, I mean, I see potential in you, you for the last hour or so you told your story. Now I gave you a little helps, but you told it well, you're self-reflective, you're intelligent, you're learning discipline. Um, you haven't, I mean, you, you haven't, you're not in prison. I, I, so my, my father's ministry, my ministry has always been in a context, except for my overseas ministry, which was a different kind of thing. But I know families where every guy is either dead or in jail. You are not dead and you're not in jail. That's an accomplishment. You're holding down a job. That's an accomplishment. Um, and you've got, and so then in this one family, I know the one guy who he, he sat, he, he talked to me in my office, just, I've just got days of him talking to me in my office him just talking and his brothers are all dead or in jail. And he grew up in gangs. Um, you know, but 
he's, you know, he's, he's made it. He's, you know, he holds down jobs. He's, he's fairly successful now with jobs. He still has lots of demons to fight internal demons. And he's going to have a lot of these till the day he dies. I know he will, but, um, you know, you, uh, an advantage you have, you don't have, you don't have a trail of women with two or three kids each that you are the father of and haven't been able to father. I mean, so in that sense, you haven't multiplied your legacy, a, a legacy of pain. So that's a good thing too. But, you know, you've, uh, you've got potential. Your, your thirties and forties are not going to be your teens and your twenties. And you're already starting to build it. And the truth is, I don't know how far it will go or even really society has these measurements that it puts on and the measurements include, you know, your, your, your gross, your, your net worth, your, I mean, all these kind of, kind of, kind of crap, but the real, the real legacies we leave behind are in the relationships and the generations. So you've got potential and I can see it and God has been working with you and in you. And I know it's slow and I know you haven't arrived or achieved. And I know that there will always be struggles. I mean, just by listening to you, 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 you sound like you've got something of a restless spirit, which is a, a curse and a blessing. <laughs> a restless spirit means you won't get stalled someplace, but it's a curse because you'll always be restless. <laughs> And, and if you can channel that restless spirit, you know, you can achieve things, you can accomplish things. And I, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a comment I read uh, on one of your videos uh, that some, I it may have been a woman, but she, she made the point about her 44 year old son. And how, you know, he just tries and tries and tries when while he's still like a, trying to be a faithful Christian and all the rest of it. Yeah. And it's like God just smacks him down. Yeah. And, you know, she said that the only lesson you come away with is that God has it out for you. Now, yeah. I read this book called, uh, it's, it was one of Jacques Salol's book called Hope and Time of Abandonment. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and, um, it was actually, it was, it was recommended by Byrne. Um, but in that book, Jacques, he makes the point that like real hope comes when there isn't any hope yes. because he makes it, this book was written in, uh, published in the early seventies. And he makes the point that it's not that God is dead. It's that God has abandoned us and is ignoring us. And I, I like, that's what I think about my life. And that's also what I think about Canada. Like, I really think God is just really like, I mean, I think other countries would say the same, but anyway, like that's, that's the only conclusion I come across because recently um, Grimm, he, he did a, he wrote a Substack article. Like, I think he, it was like yesterday or something. And he was making the point about, uh, I think it was at the end of the article that like God only cares for those who care about themselves or who take care of themselves it was something like that, mm. like in his article. So I don't know. I think that kind of ties into it, but like, you know, it, 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 when I read that comment, like it really, cause you hearted it too. And I'm like, Oh, what, what is he really does have it out for people? Like, no, no, <laughs> but, but that's how it feels. Yeah. And if you can't say that that's how it feels when it feels that way, then, I mean, that's when church gets really hard because when you go to church and everybody says, well, God wants the best for you and he's going to give you everything. And, and there you are and you're feeling like God has abandoned you. Yeah. Well, that makes church really hard, but read the Psalms. I mean, if you just read the Psalms, it, they're right there in the Bible. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus says that from the cross, you know? And so if if you, there is place in the Christian life to say, this is what it feels right now. And if Jesus Christ could say that on the cross, while he was doing the heavy lifting for the salvation of the world, 
then there had better be a place in church to say that. It's in the Bible. It's in the Psalms. It's in Jesus' mouth. So that's why I heard a statement like that, because that's how it feels. And I can't explain I can't sit there and diagnose everything and say, God is doing this, God is doing that. It's all point of the book of Job. And what's amazing about the book of Job is it's explained in the first, at the beginning of the book. The whole book is explained in the beginning of the book, but Job doesn't see it. And so God doesn't say, oh, I, did a, I had a little wager. No, God doesn't explain himself. God just says, you have to trust me. Peterson says this actually in his Bishop Barron talk. And when he talks about Job, it's a really good section. And because this is, this is what the life of faith is because you're not seeing the love, but you're trusting that it's there. So I should find that book, a friend of mine or a guy I know um, wrote this book on mother Teresa. And then he, he says to me, I didn't know the guy well, he's just in the same denomination. He says, I want you to write a blurb for the back of the book. It's like, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm a real help in terms of publishing. I said, well, send me the book. So he sent me the book. And I didn't know much about Mother Teresa except what she did in Calcutta. And that's the famous stuff because everybody looks and says, oh, she's so giving. Oh, she's so helpful. And in the book blew me away. It's a tiny little thin book. And this guy read her diaries, you know, after she died, her letters and diaries. And what you just described is how she felt all the time. And yet she cared for the people that are considered garbage. I mean, they were not only considered garbage, they were treated like garbage in the streets of India. And she couldn't save them, so she just fed them, gave them a little bit of water, a little bit of food in their dying day, but she felt what you just said. So there has to be a place for this in the church. And, and so, and I think if you want to talk about great faith, I don't see it in televangelists who are claiming, you know, divine healings and all of this stuff. I see this in people who feel like you feel and say, okay, God, you might, you might, you might have given me a shitty lot in life, but I'm going to love you still. And I'm going to be faithful to you still. And I'm not leaving you still. To me, that's the heart of faith. And that's why it's in Psalms. And that's why it's in Jesus' mouth. So, you yeah. know, yet though he slay me, I will trust in him. That's what Job says. And, you know, his wife says, curse God and die. This is what his wife says. It's like, great. How, how even my wife wants me to <laughs> give in to the darkness. <laughs> <In> magic <Yeah>. missiles. <laughs> then it becomes even, then it becomes the most tempting. Yeah. yeah. Give up. Yeah. So. So I think, I think you attack the darkness with faith. And even when there isn't a glimmer of the presence of God, like Jesus on that cross. And 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 Jesus, the perfect man, cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And just read the rest of Psalm 22. I mean, it's a brutal psalm, and it's not the only one. <laughs> There's lots of them in there that are like that. And, and that is the path of faith. And you're walking it. And yeah, there's there's work to be done. I get that. You know, there's always work to be done. I, was, I got a ton of work to do in me. Every Everyone on this side of the grave has a whole lot of work to do. That's just true. And people are in different places. That's just true. But um, to me, you know, what what you can say, you know, <laughs> that there's this there's this old evangelism explosion trick where you would knock on a door and you would say to someone, you know, if you were to die tonight, why? And you and, and God would ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? And the, the correct answer to that is because you sent your son into this world and he suffered. 
and I'm going to appeal. You know, this is the thief on the cross. You know, it, it's funny because in one gospel, they're both sort of, you know, mocking Jesus. And in Luke, one of them turns and is it Luke or Matthew? I don't know. But one of them turns and 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 defends Jesus and says, hey, look, you know, we, you and I, we, we're brigands. We've been trying to bring down the Roman Empire and killing people to do it and robbing and stealing. But he just says the truth. This guy hasn't done any of that. I mean, he's done none of that. And and all he does is says, says to Jesus, remember me when you come into his your kingdom. And he has no time to do any good works for the rest of his life because he has no rest of his life. And Jesus says to him, surely you will be with me in paradise. I mean, to me, that is the gospel. It's right there. And now yeah. God is giving you more time. Probably. You never know. We don't, you, you could, either one of us could die 10 minutes after we stop recording this. But you just look to him. And, and even if you feel like he's turned his back on you, you just tell him, no, no, you don't turn your back on me. If you sent your son for me, you're going to, you know, and you, and he came down to live in this mess. You're not going to abandon me. And, you know, and let's just look at how Job does this. Abraham does this. Paul does this. And Jesus does this. And so if if you think God is is turning his back on you, just tell him no. You you, you go ahead. They might not have the feels, but I absolutely deny that you will abandon me. I'm going to hold you to your son. And Abraham had less to hold God to, but he still did it with respect to Sodom and Gomorrah. Just didn't go far enough. And Job holds him to it. So that's the kind of faith yeah. he can build in you well <clears throat> the thing is is like so i'm taking uh i'm taking hvac courses yeah like i'm i'm in an hvac course because i i there's no future canada post <laughs> it's a crown corporation so just forget about it but um you know in this course there's some there's some younger guys like 18 19 yeah and you know, when you, when you talk to Zoomers, like I, uh, if you talk to them and ask them their opinions on marriage, the, the general, the, the general thinking is, is like Zoomer guys, like they, they basically just say, uh, um, uh, what do they say? Oh, well, no, man, are you kidding me? All the free time, like all the time spent, they have to be with her and all the time wasted and blah, blah, blah. And like all, like being able to have the place to yourself and like, you know, like it's an obvious cope. Because they the don't reality know. they is, don't know shit. They're 18 or 19 years old. They don't know yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. And it's in it, but the thing is, it's like it's not even true. Like, I don't actually believe that's what they believe. What they what they think is like, you know, it's like and be humiliated even more. Because I think that's might might be what they want to say. Is like, why am I gonna want to be in a relationship where I get to be humiliated already more than I already am? Yeah. Because you look at these freaking kids. And it's like, I'm at the point where it's like, like, I just feel so freaking bad for them. Yeah. You know, it's just like, just the, the heaps of shit that they've had. Like, I mean, we had to deal with Facebook. We didn't have to deal with any of this woke propaganda. We didn't have to deal with any of this emasculating crap yeah. that we're all, you know, and, and, you know, that we're evil white males and all this, this, this stuff too, because like in Canada, like that stuff has been so demoralizing to so many guys, like, and, and it just freaking just like, you know, like I don't, I, I don't stay in contact with my sisters or my mom. Uh, yeah. Like, like me and my older sister are basically estranged from one another. Mm. And the reason is, is because we just had these seriously like we used to scream at each other mm. back in the late teens like yeah. 2016 20 like the hot years yeah you know and we just and 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 she just said things that like i needed your your like i needed their help yeah 
like I'm freaking, um, you know, ready to freaking blow my goddamn brains out. I got all the, all this shit that like, I don't want to deal with, like yeah. women want nothing to do with me. Yeah. And then you go ahead and you say all this freaking stuff about me being a privileged white male. Like yeah. it wasn't, it's it, what, that wasn't the only thing. Yeah. There was a few other things in there thrown in there. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, and, and so, you know, and they, they kind of want to, yeah, I know you have to forgive. Like, I get that, but it's like, you know, I, I just, she just to this, like to this day, there's still like my older sister and like my younger sister. And I, I can't, I, I just can't, uh, I just don't want to deal with it anymore. Yeah. Like I, um, I just need time. Yeah. I just need time. Like I yeah. just need time in this yeah. faith and like to develop some real sexual discipline and it needs yeah. to be months. Yeah. It takes months to develop this till you, yeah. till you become clean. Yeah. You yeah. become pure yeah. and your conscience becomes yeah. clean again. Yeah. Like, you know, um, so Cause I felt it before. Yeah. Like I felt the, like I felt the freedom of when your days are filled, yeah. you know, yeah. because you're, when they're you're filled living, with good things. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're living productively through yeah. the faith. Yeah. Time slows down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, I want that back, yeah. you know, and then I, I, one day, yeah, it's it's coming. I you're gonna I I I think you're gonna get there, my friend. I think you're gonna get there. I see the signs. You've you've come a long way already. You really have. It might not feel that way when you're working at Canada Post and your downstairs apartment, but you're holding a job, you're paying your rent, you're going to church. A priest knows you. A minister knows you. It's not just you know a minister on YouTube. A minister knows you. These are these are all big deals. And you're doing it. And so I really think you're going to keep doing it. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, just pray, pray for it. And so. Well, let me pray for you. I want to pray for you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Lord, from the time he was conceived, you've known Jack. You knew everything around as, as he was just a boy and didn't know anything. And you know back generations. And you know, you see all, you see all, you see all the dynamics, you see all the interrelationships, you see, you see all the pain, you see all the, the failures and shortcomings, generations back, you, you know it all. And Lord, you, you have, you have been with this young man and, and you have, you have brought him to yourself and you have brought him into your church. And you are working through that church. You are working through. You're working through Jordan Peterson. You're working through this little corner. You're working through all of these layers. And Lord, and 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 Jack has come to the point where he is now. Well, he's now here, and and the work isn't done. But the work in none of us is done, because we all have have far to go. And so, Lord, I pray that you give him the the purity that he desires. I pray that you give him the, the self-discipline that, that he really wants. I pray, Lord, that you give him the even just the self-discipline in small things, to go to bed on time, to get up on time, to, to say no to the things that, that capture him and to, to say yes to the good containers, to, to show up at work on time, to show up at church on time, to keep meeting with his with his minister to 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 make friends to to find that one or two people in that little church of his that has lived a life that that can teach Jack what what you've made it to teach him 
And I pray, Lord, that you will give him a sense that he is in your hand, that you are the great container, and that no matter how he feels, if he's angry with you, he can he can cry out. The words are all there in the Psalms if he needs words to say. And, and many of those words in the Psalms, he might read and think, oh, I wouldn't dare say that. But Lord, you can take it because it's right there. We know it. And your only son cried out from this 22nd Psalm. And we know this, Lord. So I pray, Lord, that you give him your spirit, that you put your hand upon him, and that you bless his church, and that you bless his priest, and that you bless his job, and that you you bring around him the people that he needs to, to take whatever next step he needs to take and whatever area of life he needs, and that he in time will be, vel- be able to develop the vision that says, you will never leave him nor forsake him. Lord, I, I pray this for him, and I ask that you give him this, Lord. And, and we ask this in the name of Jesus, because this is, this is why Jesus came, because Jesus came for him. And I pray, Lord, that he would not only know this in an intellectual way, but there, that, that there might be moments when he knows it emotionally as well. And I know, Lord, that those feelings, they never last all the time. We go up and down, and there are dark days and maybe even dark periods, long nights of the soul. But we know, Lord, that this is how you make saints. This is how you make saints. You make saints through suffering and hardship. And he knows these things. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless him and that you give him strength. And then you make him into the man that you know he is able to become. So hear my prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you for your story. And um, I'm gonna, I will I will send you the copy of this. I don't know. Do I? Yeah, I have an email for you. Okay, I'll send you a copy of this, and you can decide what we should do with it. If you want to just keep it between us, that's fine. If you want to just share it with your priest, that's fine. If you want it in the memberships, then that's fine. People want different things for their stories, and so it's up to you what you want to do with it. So think okay, about it. excellent. Okay. All right. Thanks again. This is uh, this was. It was such a pleasure to finally meet you. Wow. It's like years on end. The your, pleasure, your boomer, the pleasure is all mine. Yeah, it's your boomer moment with Calendy. Was like, <laughs> I, take- <laughs> I I knew. I thought, well, I you know, God arranges, God arranges things even in our accidents. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care. I'll be in touch. Yeah. Take care. See you, Paul. All right. Bye. Bye. See you.